Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I am Jesse with Kentucky Youth Advocates. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. And as I say every week, it's good to see you if you are here for the very first time. And it's great to see you if you have been here through all 20 or however many of these that, that we have done. Um, I'm really starting to recognize like the family members and some of the like uh -huh. family photos that y'all have behind your heads. Uh, and uh, <laughs> really appreciate that. So uh, just a reminder that we are recording today's forum to share later as both a video and a podcast. And we'll share that with you all so you can share that with your networks if you like. And we ask that you stay muted, but we encourage you to like ask questions or drop in comments in the chat feature. And we at KYA will answer those if we know the answer, but also we'll, we will collect those uh, to try and get some follow-up information to you as well. So with that, I am gonna kick it over to Terry Brooks, who is going to welcome our very special guest today and get us started. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Yeah, we are just so delighted today to have uh, Congressman John Yarmuth uh, joining us. Uh, you know, uh, there's a wonderful quote from Nelson Mandela that says, great peacemakers are all people of integrity, of honesty, and of humility. Uh, Congressman, I'm really glad that my congressman, because I am your constituent, uh, exemplifies uh, that Mandela quote and uh, Editorially, I'm not sure if there's a moment that we don't need smart peacemakers more than we do right now. So we really do appreciate you being here. Uh, I have been told that I cannot ask if Congress could pass a bill mandating a U of L UK football game. So I, I will not do that, but I would like to. Uh, I just want to, for our folks who are gathered. Uh, just, and I, I assume that for most of you, Congressman Yarmouth does not need an introduction. Uh, I could read what the bio says, but I'd rather talk about action. Uh, before the pandemic even began, uh, as so many of you on this call are early childhood related, you know there was lots of conversations in Congress about early childhood. What impressed me was Congressman Yarmouth uh, actually wanted to do a field trip and he visited uh, the Keystone Learning Academy in his district and talked to workers and kids and parents and then continued to Zoom with childcare workers. So he really put uh, shoe leather behind that commitment. Uh, when we think about childcare now, uh, it's important to emphasize that uh, Kentucky had only one member of its congressional delegation that voted yes on the Child Care is Essential Act, that provided $50 billion in child care relief funding, means Kentucky could get $958 million. Uh, that one yes vote was our guest today. Uh, Congressman, I also appreciate that you're one of those guys that understands that kids don't grow up in silos. Uh, Many of you have heard us talk about that food insecurity has been an under-discussed issue uh, in the pandemic. Uh, it was Congressman Yarmouth who championed uh, a House Emergency Stabilization Act that really provided lots of flexible funding that allowed folks to meet those kind of needs of homelessness and food insecurity. So, Congressman, uh, there's so much rhetoric uh, I really appreciate that, again, my congressman is about action, not rhetoric. So welcome today, and we appreciate in your schedule giving us this time. No, well, uh, thanks for having me, Terry, and, and thanks uh, to Kentucky Youth Advocates for um, its record and its commitment to uh, our, our children. You know, I, I think if you've, if you've heard Nancy Pelosi over the last uh, few weeks talking about a potential relief package, she always says it's all about the children. And, and I think that that's how we, uh, we Democrats in Congress, kind of, that's the prism through, we, through which we look at everything. Uh, what are we doing to ensure the best possible future for uh, our youngest citizens? And um, you, know, I, you mentioned the Keystone trip and 
I will say that was a, um, an epiphany for me. Uh, an epiphany that I, I talk about, and I've probably mentioned Keystone Academy um, two or three hundred times since I've been there to different people. I, I, everybody I ask in town who's in a decision-making capacity, uh, have you, do you know about Keystone Academy? Have you been there? And urge them to do it. And what it was, it was, it was not an epiphany for me to know that we need to focus on childhood education, but it is, uh, it became an epiphany for me to see the, how much progress a child as young as a year, a year and a half old could make put in the right environment. And so I've been talking about now the, the three or four things that we as a country have to focus on intently right now if we're going to have a viable future. And one of those is early childhood education. Uh, I, I do sincerely mean that uh, if we don't make sure that every child has access to the type of programming that Keystone provides, then we're missing a real opportunity to, to uh, make a down payment on, on the country's future. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're going to work on that. Hopefully we have a, uh, and I don't want to get too partisan, but hopefully we have an all democratic government next year <laughs> and we will actually be able to do a lot of the things that uh, we're, we've been proposing, we've been working on uh, this year and last and uh, things that really would uh, make your roles much easier as well. So um, let me just say where we are real quickly. And by the way, those of you who may be out there wondering, I'll answer the question for you, that why I wear this F. I'm not a Florida fan, I'm not a Gator fan. This is actually my uh, rating from the National Rifle Association. I get an, I've had an F rating, I mean a failing grade uh, for my voting record on gun safety legislation from their perspective uh, every year and I'm proud of it. So uh, I, wear the, I wear this pin. And actually, once we started, so I, I had these pins made and was circulating among my colleagues. And uh, shortly thereafter, the NRA took their grading system off the website wow. because they, they said uh, our enemies are using the grades against us. So I thought that was pretty hilarious. Uh, and I apologize to any NRA members out there. The NRA members are not the problem. It's the NRA uh, leadership. <laughs> And, and the members of Congress who pay too much attention to them. But let me tell you where we are real quickly. Uh, you know, we, we in, in mid-March, many of us realized very quickly that we were facing an unprecedented challenge to the country, a healthcare challenge and an economic challenge primarily. And unlike any other challenge we have faced as, as a country, this came on us very, very quickly. It was widespread and it was very deep. So, our, our initial uh, strategy was, let's do, do as much as we can right now, forget about long-term financial implications or uh, budgetary implications. Let's get as much money out into this economy and help people right now because we knew unemployment was gonna go off the charts uh, and, and we knew people were gonna be hurting. So we did that in actually in three, three or four stages, three different uh, bills. The last one, the CARES Act, which was the largest and that was uh, about two trillion dollars, and that provided the six hundred dollar a week federal unemployment insurance supplement, um, uh, and a lot of other funding to state and local governments, and a lot of other things to um, to help bolster the, the American people and keep the economy afloat. Uh, we realized at the time we did that, we thought I think everybody kind of assumed that we would uh, this would be a two or three month issue crisis and that we would come up with therapeutics uh, or something that that would mitigate the the Im impact and the, the society would essentially return to fairly normal in a short period of time even though the economic damage would be done so that's why for instance we when we created what was called the paycheck protection program which was to fund the smaller businesses payroll for eight weeks that's why we came up with the eight weeks we thought getting through midsummer it would be done well clearly that uh, it's not happening. We knew in May that that was not going to be the case. So we drafted the HEROES Act and passed the HEROES Act. And the HEROES Act is $3.4 trillion. Yes, a lot of money. Um, but among other things, it continued the $600 per week uh, unemployment payments uh, through January of next year. It um, 
provided almost a trillion dollars in assistance to state and local governments whose budgets have taken a real hit uh, during this uh, crisis. Uh, money for education uh, protection for uh, renters and, and mortgagees so that uh, there were no evictions and um, there was rental assistance and, and uh, mortgage payment assistance in that bill as well. So we tried to approach every bit of the, of the issue as, as comprehensively as we could. Uh, again, that was March, uh, May 15. At the time, Mitch McConnell uh, said, not so fast, we're gonna wait and see how things go, which at the time was not totally stupid. Uh, I, I will say there, that was a reasonable thing to think, um, but it was not a reasonable thing for him to stop doing any work and to stop planning for what they might need to do in the Senate. So yeah, it's fine, don't pass anything if you think we, can, we, we should wait a month or two and see how things go, but prepare. Instead, what he did was sit on his hands and wait until essentially one week before all of the unemployment supplement was going to, um, to uh, expire. And then, then he started working on a bill. So they came up with a bill at the end of July, which was a, about a, a trillion dollars, so a third of what we proposed doing. Um, it, I'm not gonna go into everything it did or didn't do because it, it's actually, it's not gonna be enacted. And they're working now on another proposal, a slimmed down proposal. But uh, that's where we are. So as of Ju July 31st, all of those $600 a week supplements uh, expired um, and the, the eviction protection, the moratorium expired. Many of the other provisions of the CARES Act uh, are no longer in, in, uh, um, in effect. So we're, we're now sitting uh, with retail sales already showing a, a decline in the last few days because that money's running out. The people, the, the money that people had through the unemployment insurance and other things, we had, it was a $1,200 per person, per adult, $500 per child a supplement in the CARES Act as well. Um, we're, we were proposing to do something additionally like that. So we're now waiting. And uh, also, as you probably know, there was assistance for the post office in the HEROES Act, uh, which we uh, desperately need to make sure that they can handle the, the uh, expenses of a, an election where so many more ballots will be, uh, will be sent by mail. And um, now we're, debate, we're fighting over that. It's become the, the headline issue, I guess, of, of relief. And we're going back to Washington on Saturday to vote on a new bill uh, to provide resources for the post office. So that's where we are right now. And uh, that's so, me to shut up and respond to you. you all. Yeah. So, so uh, take us inside the uh, what's going to happen, uh, regardless of where one sits uh, politically. Uh, I must tell you, Congressman, I, I sat breathlessly when you said that Leader McConnell was sitting on his, and I was waiting for you to. Finish <laughs> that. I'm so happy you said hands. Uh, yeah. But uh, the uh, uh, we've talked on this show before, or uh, that. Uh, uh, I'm very captivated by a book that Olympia Snow put out, uh, Fighting for Common Ground. And she talked about when she initially came to the House, there were Republicans more liberal than some conservative Democrats, and there were some Democrats more conservative than some liberal Republicans. And that was the, the basis of so much good work that got done. Uh, no one would suggest that's the case now. So we know that heroes and heels have some actually common elements and lots of differences. Uh, the folks on this call are not novices when it comes to policy and politics. So take us behind the scenes of what's, what's going to happen to prevent a train wreck. Uh, you know, what does it mean for House leaders like you and Speaker Pelosi to sit down with folks like Leader McConnell and his team and wind up getting something done. Can you can you kind of project and give us a, a little bit of inside baseball as to what we might be looking at? And then we'll get into content, but I'd, I'd like to hear your acumen on process. Um, well, the process is not what 
we would call regular order. Uh, that's, that's a term that is used in, the, in uh, the Congress a lot to describe the way things are intended to be done and the way the tradition and the rules would prescribe. Uh, not, it rarely, regular order rarely happens now. I could spend an, ent an entire day talking about the dysfunction of Congress and, and what's going on there, but I will describe, I, get, I will summarize the entire dysfunction in one word and it, it, it encompasses a lot of different dynamics. Nobody gets rewarded for compromising. That's the bottom line. Uh, there is, uh, and mat as a matter of fact, you are more likely to be politically penalized uh, mm -hmm. for compromising than you are to be rewarded. And that, ref that manifests itself in, in financial ways and in electoral ways, primary challenges, uh, media, all sorts of dynamics, but that's the, that's the bottom line. And so th that's not an easy thing to fix. If there's, yeah. if there's nothing in it for you to, to compromise. And that, and that works on both sides of the aisle. That's a dynamic that affects everybody. So what has happened is the mentality of Congress has really shifted and it's it shifted. And I was a staffer on Capitol Hill back in the 70s and it was a very different world. And Larry, uh, Terry, you talked about it with that, with uh, quoting Olympia Snow and I can actually quantify that a little bit more for you. Uh, but uh, there, there is no governing mentality in Congress right now. Almost everything is done through an, with an electoral mentality. So whatever the issue is, the question generally becomes where, on this issue, what do I do to gain elect, an electoral advantage? Not what do I do to help solve a problem or fix something or create a new initiative. Um, and that's very sad, but, and again, that afflicts both parties. I, I think it afflicts Republicans more than Democrats. But the other thing we have is um, once the Tea Party, uh, later called the Freedom Caucus, took over the Congress in, in 2010, uh, the idea that the federal government had a role to play in making people's lives better was not something that the majority thought was val a valid thought. It was government was, was uh, there to, to run an armed for the armed forces and basically that was it. And the rest of the, the mentality was government needs to get out of the way. So from 2010 to 2018, uh, particularly in the House, the only thing Republicans did other than get a tax cut, push a tax cut through in 2017, was to pass legislation that deregulated virtually every aspect of society. And they never went anywhere, fortunately, because Barack Obama was president for six of those years. And then they weren't able to pass a lot of that in the Senate because of the Senate 60 vote rule. But that's really what Republicans have become. They become a society, cut taxes, deregulate everything you can, um, and that's it. And you know, you've seen efforts through, for instance, through the education department to uh, promote charter schools and private schools and, and, and de-emphasize public education. Uh, at the federal level, uh, you've seen efforts to um, on, on health care constantly to repeal and replace the well, I should say to repeal the Affordable Care Act. There has been no attempt to replace it because, quite honestly, there only is one way to replace the affordable health care, and that's for single payer or Medicare for all. Um, and they don't want to do that. So we, we've got one party that, that really is interested in making the government work better and, and work to help people, and we've got one which put one party that doesn't think that's the government's role. And so, that, so that's, and look, real quick, I'll, I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, no, go right ahead. In 2010, um, there used to be a publication that would rank everybody in Congress as to how liberal or conservative they, yeah. were, they were. And once they did that, they would do a, gra a graphic. And the graphic was in the House, 435 vertical lines, Republicans in red, Democrats in blue. And in 2010, which was the last voting year before the, the Freedom Caucus took over, when, when we lost 60-something seats in the House, the, the, the middle portion where black and red lines overlapped, so where you, to your point, Terry or Olympia, is that uh, these are where more, more, some Republicans were more liberal than some Democrats. That was about 80 people in the middle. In 2013, which was the, uh, 
for the 2013 voting year, two elections, after two elections later when Democrats lost ground, uh, there were four overlapping. Wow. And that's where, the, that's where compromises got forged. And, and that's, that's, that's what's happened. It hasn't really changed. So take us, I want to get to the issues on the table, but again, we've got a group on this call that they can read those graph comparisons and understand. Yep. So I, I want to, I appreciate your authenticity on this. Uh, that polarization, you talked about the electoral motivation, which I get. Uh, you know, I've read that that's gerrymandering. I've heard that that's campaign finance laws. I've heard that's cable news. I've heard D, all of the above. Uh, the, the John Yarmouth lens, uh, how did we get where we got? Uh, that didn't just happen. Uh, uh, what were the motivating and driving factors? And do you have hope that that could change? Um, yeah, I have hope. Uh, the answer is all of the above. <laughs> and I would say right now, probably the financial part of it is the most significant. And what I mean by that is, if you're running from, let's say, the second district of Kentucky, uh, I just throw that out for no particular reason. I don't know that that I don't think that's going to be a competitive race. But uh, but if if you have a competitive race in the second district of Kentucky and you have to raise two or three million dollars to campaign, where are you going to get it? They're not. There's not that much money in in. Uh, in South Central Kentucky in the second district to, to available to those people. So if you're a Republican, what you do is you get on the phone and you call wealthy, reliable Republican donors in Texas and in Florida and elsewhere, and you ask them for money. And the only reason they would give money to a candidate in Kentucky is if they can count on that candidate to be a reliable cons conservative Republican vote. And similarly with, with Democrats, you know, calling people in New York and California and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's that dependence on, on donors that don't really have a specific interest in your district that puts you in that position of having basically to pledge your fealty to, um, to whatever Republican or Democratic leadership does. Okay, that's, that's a great answer. And I appreciate it. Again, I appreciate your authenticity on that. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you talk, talk to us a little bit, because uh, I know that uh, – that at least when it comes to the HEROES Act, uh, we could lift up so many factors in that. Uh, food assistance, income support for children and families, public benefits like TANF and Medicaid for children and families. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those big arenas? Are there some where you feel like the House and Senate are closer and then there are others where there is this bifurcation and divide that is just going to be really difficult to, so what's a ditch and what's a canyon? That's how I guess maybe I would put it. Okay, let, well, let, me, let me make one point at the outset. Every Republican voted, every Republican in the Senate voted for the CARES Act. Mm -hmm. All right. So the elements of the CARES Act, which are many of which you just mentioned, they've already supported. So it's really not a philosophical problem. I mean, there are not many people, Republicans or Democrats, who don't believe that now is a time to shore up Medicaid when you have so many more people relying on it for their health care in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, there, there are not many people who will argue that uh, we have to help our schools, uh, help fund our schools so they can get back into operation. Uh, the, most people won't argue that state and local budgets have been severely damaged by this crisis. There is a difference of opinion however, in how to help them. Uh, again, we provided money in the CARES Act for state and local governments. We restricted the way it was used. And so it had to be used for COVID-related costs. Uh, Republicans say that, oh, well, a lot of that money hasn't been put to use yet. And that's true, but that doesn't mean that money hasn't been committed. And that's, that's the case in Kentucky. A lot of that money that Kentucky got, who cares, has not been spent but it's been committed for use. Um, and so, and there, there are people on the Republican side who say, well, as Mitch has said, uh, we, don't wanna, we don't wanna reward states for bad behavior. Well, nobody behaved badly in regard to the pandemic. Some have, re, some have acted foolishly uh, in responding to it, but it wasn't anybody's fault. And everybody was hurt, red states and blue states, red cities and, and blue cities. But uh, so that, that's become a real big sticking point. 
on the education side, uh, there's $107 billion, I think, and there was in the uh, Senate bill, but 70% of that was reserved for schools that, only for schools that open in-person education, in-person instruction. So they basically took, again, 70% off the table to try to force schools to open when they may not want to or, or say, be able to do that safely. So that's, um, but, but most of the things in principle, both sides have already agreed are legitimate uses. And it, so it, it's not helpful when Mitch and many other Republicans come out and say, this was a, you know, our, the HEROES Act is a democratic wish list. Well, first of all, that, that's everything in the, virtually everything. I mean, there, there were a couple of things that people tried to shove in there that probably weren't justifiable. But, you know, we, we knew that the CARES Act was not going to be, I mean, the HEROES Act was not going to be passed as passed by the House because, enacted as the House did. It was a bargaining, it was a statement. Here's what we think we ought to do. And, but in the Senate bill, there's 600 and something million dollars for the F-35 fighter jet. What does that have to do with COVID relief? Really? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> goes both goes both ways and uh, and then the, the other argument of course is it's, it's just too much money a lot of people say it's too much money but you have people like Jay Powell the chairman of the Federal Reserve who's a Republican appointee who says we have the we have the fiscal room to do it uh, we have the money to do it debt is not a problem right now we need to we need to spend what we need to spend and you got a guy named Douglas Holtzikin who was a deficit hawk one of the strongest deficit hawks you can imagine who says the same thing. He said, no, that doesn't matter right now. Um, we need to spend money. We need to do more. So, um, you know, what's going to solve it? Um, the only thing I can think of right now is that um, the, the polls get so bad for Republicans that they say this is, this is killing our any chance we have of maintaining the, the majority in the Senate. And you know, that, I think they were beginning to feel that way about the post office, about the postal service. Um, but that's not going to get it done today or tomorrow or next week. And that's, that's what really concerns me is, while we're basically dysfunctional and not getting anything done, the American people are paying the price. And, and these are innocent American people who again did nothing wrong and are are suffering and are, you know some are losing their homes uh, and not knowing where they can turn for everyday expenses. So uh, I don't know what. Yeah. Again, we so, we the, the Senate's trying to they're putting together another bill um, with three hundred dollars a week instead of six hundred dollars uh, a week and a couple of other provisions and. You know, if they, my guess is, and I don't know this, but this is the way things usually happen. My guess is there are a lot of talks going on, but they don't involve Nancy, Chuck Schumer, Mitch, um, Stephen Mnuchin, and Mark Meadows. But the, at, the, these are at staff level trying to figure out where they, we can actually get something done. So when I look at a lot of chats coming in, we know that, and you've said this very eloquently, we know there are immediate needs on the table. Uh, if, if I were to do the John Yarmouth crystal ball, uh, and you kind of alluded to that already, uh, are we looking at nothing until election day? We're looking at incremental agreements on targeted sectors because uh, it doesn't sound like you're very encouraged about a, an omnibus compromise, let's roll this out. Can you, can you right. talk a little bit about, uh, uh, yeah. from your lens, what do you think we could gather hope for? Yeah, uh, thanks, Terry. I, I actually wrote Nancy, uh, a text to Nancy the other day and said, I think we've got to get off this position that we have to have a comprehensive piece of legislation. We need to do what we, ha what we can do right now. And I think what I said to her, and I've said it publicly as well, I don't think we're losing the messaging battle on this, but I don't think we're winning it either. And I think the American people are just fed up with, with everybody and the inaction. So I said, we need, to, we need to propose some things that make sense and that, that indicate that we're willing to compromise. So I said, for instance, let's do, 
let's say we're going to continue the $600 for four or six weeks, and then we're going to cut it down to $400 or $450, just to, to show that we're willing to move on this stuff, but also to show that we, we want to do something right now. The whole idea of, you know, the, the idea of comprehensive proposals, uh, it, it, my experience started with immigration and people would say there are so many things that we both sides agree on in the immigration battle. You might, why don't we just do that? You know, H1B visas, getting high skilled people into the country more easily. <laughs> and the reason there, which we said, no, we're not going to do that because then you do, you do the easy stuff and you don't do the hard stuff. You don't deal with the 11 million undocumented uh, actual Americans uh, who are in, in, the, in the country right now. That's not what this is about. The, this is not something where there's a, a real difficult part that uh, absolutely has to get done so you don't agree to anything without that. Uh, unemployment can be done, state and local support can be done, expanded Medicaid can be done, exp um, increase in SNAP uh, payments can be done. Uh, there are a lot of things that, are, uh, <clears throat> that we could do separately and you know, I wish we would, we would do that. Uh, I think that's what the Senate is pro actually proposing to do. They're only going to deal with like four different issues, it's my understanding. They're going to deal with the, deal with the unemployment, they're going to deal with uh, tort immunity, for, uh, which is a big deal with Mitch, um, and I think education and one other thing. Yeah. And you know, may, that's probably something like that's probably what's going to happen and it's probably going to get done in September when we uh, when we have to pass a funding bill for next year because the fiscal year ends September 30th so we have to we'll pass what's called a continuing resolution which funds most programs at current levels because uh, the Republicans haven't done any of their appropriations bills we've done 10 out of the 12 we have to do uh, but they haven't done any so we'll do a continuing resolution and and probably put these incremental things not I shouldn't say incremental these individual uh, initiatives in that bill that's, that's my best. That's my yeah. best guess. And that that progress record is probably because the House has such an outstanding chair of the Budget Committee. I would assume. Without, that's, without that's question, the yeah. Reason we got our budget, we got our two-year budget agreement done uh, last year. So yeah, good. We, we did our work. So the again, the folks on the call know this. Uh, you know, you can go, and we we will post more than you can possibly read on heroes, heels, et cetera, what the congressman has talked about. But, hey, we don't get a John Yarmouth on this uh, often enough. So I want to, Congressman, I want to shift to a couple bigger picture questions, if that's okay sure. with you. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I know this, you are not a latecomer to this. Uh, and I, again, this is a, uh, I told you before we began, I wanted to ask you some open-ended questions because mm -hmm. I appreciate the depth of your answers. Uh, where in the world and what in the world should we be doing in communities and state and Congress around uh, the whole issue of racial injustice that has just inflamed uh, headlines and have people activated? Again, that is certainly not an issue that, that, uh, that, you, that is new to you, but we certainly all are looking at in a different way. I want to give you a chance just to offer your reflections on where we sit as a country and as a state? Um, well, the, the problems are the same. I mean, every, every this, it's certainly a national challenge right now. And different communities have different variations on it. I mean, Louisville's, we have the Breonna Taylor case, which makes, makes it a, a more volatile issue, I guess. Um, just like Minneapolis had George Floyd and, and Portland and other cities have had their particular cases. But yeah, I, I think the first thing we have to recognize is when we're looking for solutions, we can't do it the way white society has always done it, which is basically form a blue ribbon commission with all the usual suspects and you know, and bring consultants in and instead of asking people what the hell we ought to be doing. Uh, I think in community after community across the country, we have to have our, our black residents tell us what, we, what we're doing wrong, tell, 
the community what it's doing wrong and what we what we need to change and how we need to change it. And I think we get we would get a much more receptive public because we would be engaging um, those people who are most directly affected by by the challenges. Uh, there's some cool things going on in, in the community right now. And, you know, I, I feel so sorry for Greg Fisher because this is not a Trump, Trumpian statement. <laughs> Greg Fisher has done more for West Louisville and during his term of office than any mayor has ever done. Uh, there's, you know, more than a billion dollars worth of, of progress going on in West Louisville. And you still have people who are out there saying, oh, they're, they're protesting because they, they say it's gentrification when you've got, again, tons of development going on there and, and there's gonna be even more. And it's not being done to displace black residents, black citizens, it's, it's being done to respond to what has been a multi-generational complaint that the West End has been ignored. Uh, but again, I think the first thing to do is to, is to look for answers with the people from the people who are most directly affected. And beyond that, you know, I have individual ideas. You know, we'll, if we if we take over the government next year, uh, the entire government, you're going to have some really interesting conversations that take place. Serious conversations about universal basic income. Serious conversations about reparations. Um, serious conversations about housing and how do we uh, these are going on in pockets some some are going on in Louisville but how do you how do you make up for and so this is part of reparations in, in my mind how do you make up for the fact that when we ended slavery we promised every black uh, American 40 acres and a mule and they never got it well the way you do that right now is do everything you can to put people in homes and help build wealth wealth in their homes uh, so you're going to see that conversation, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, early childhood education, uh, you know, there was a period, there was a, a day some recently, I think it was like two months ago, when a, ch a child was born that day who represented the, um, a change in the percentage of non-white children born in America. This was the first child born where, who represented a majority of non-white babies in the country. Now, what does that mean? That means in two generations, the, vet, the significant majority of the workforce is going to be non-white. Now, that's also the tax base. So if we don't make sure, regardless of what their family resources or situation is right now, if we don't make sure that these kids don't have the kind of foundation they need, then what's the tax base going to look like two generations from now? And uh, so that's one of the reasons I think that this emphasis on early childhood education has to start right now, uh, because it's the key. To, it's the key to the future. So I think you're going to have a lot of conversations like that next year, and you know, you're seeing if you're watching any of the Democratic convention, you're seeing the diversity of our uh, Democratic con Congress de uh, contingents. And uh, that's, uh, these are gonna be the leaders going forward. I mean, you know, AOC's become kind of a, um, a pinata for Republicans on the right. But let me tell you, AOC is super smart. And she is, she's super smart, not just in a social media way or communications, which, which she is superb at, but she is super smart on a policy basis. And we have member after member in there 30s and early 40s uh, that come from very diverse backgrounds who have who are just waiting to to change this country. So you're going to see again a, a very different Congress and a lot of different kind of conversations if we take the Senate and the presidency. The other issue that uh, that at least I almost get uh, that is daunting to me because you hear such different narratives and and I think I understand that. But when it's all said and done, uh, realistically, what is election day or election week or election month uh, going to look like? I mean, you talk about uh, totally different narratives depending on who you listen to. 
is the whole issue of how we vote, when we vote, why we vote. Uh, I want to give you, I know that's something that, again, is uh, close to your heart and brain. Uh, give us the Yarmouth take on uh, what we should be doing, and then do that Yarmouth prediction on what we'll <laughs> be doing. Well, I think what we ought to be doing is what we've done here in Kentucky, and, and that's uh, have both sides get together and come up with a reasonable plan for conducting the elections. Most, most states already do have them. Uh, most states don't have to change. There are a lot of states that already allow no excuse early voting and, a lot, and uh, uh, have, have some version of mail-in, mail, vote by mail. Oregon is mandatory. Everybody votes by mail in Oregon. California is close to that. Colorado is, is the same way. So a lot of states have already figured it out. And, and I was real proud of Michael Adams and, and Andy Bashir the way they did. I think it was a very, very, very reasonable uh, plan and Mitch McConnell and I agree on something for once that, that <laughs> it was reasonable. Uh, so I, I think uh, I'm not, I'm not worried too much about, about that. I, I read, I'm right, but I, let me step back a second. I'm writing a piece right now, which basically says or contends that if you think about it, our system of elections and the peaceful transition of power is the thing that has always made the United States exceptional. Nothing else. Mm -hmm. I mean, the military, yeah, we've got a strong military. So does China, so does North Korea. You know, we, everybody's got, you know, yeah, we're probably wealthier than any other country, <laughs> but money doesn't make you exceptional. Uh, but, but our one claim to fame was that nobody has, nobody has ever, no country, no society has ever been as successful in transitioning power based on elections that United States has been, and that's, that's in jeopardy now. Uh, but I, I think, you know, I think that the post office is going to be fine. I, I think there's going to be an awful lot of public service announcements saying vote early. You know, I think you can get your, you can request your absentee ballot in Kentucky starting Friday. I believe that's when it is. And so, you know, Put your request in. I don't know when they're going to start sending them out, but as soon as they send them out, uh, make your vote your your uh, cast your vote and and mail it back. And and I think you're going to hear a lot about that from everywhere, everybody across the country. Social media is going to be filled with it. Get your vote done early. Don't wait till election day. I think there will be some d delays um, in counting, but my guess is we will know who the next president's going to be uh, on November 4th, which, by the way, is my birthday. All right. And so I'm either going to have, I'm either going to have the best birthday of my life or the worst. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's well, not going to be an ordinary birthday. Uh, one thing that, that I want you to do <clears throat> is, I guess, give folks a little bit of a raw-raw and uh, Here's my sense. Uh, when I look at uh, the, the dozens of folks on this call, uh, I see folks who are really comfortable wrestling with issues in Frankfurt. Uh, really very articulate, effective, great connections. Sometimes I sense uh, this is not the case with you because when folks see you out, you're very accessible and folks, at least in the third congressional district, I think believe that you're a very uh, approachable kind of guy. Uh, but it is kind of dawning uh, to think about uh, a U.S. representative or Senators uh, Paul and McConnell. And I, I sometimes worry, frankly, that really thoughtful folks like who are on this call wonder, can I impact? I mean, I may be able to impact those guys in Frankfurt, but should I even bother with, with Washington? So can you do a little uh, civics rah-rah uh, for us? Because I believe that that is an important role and nobody yeah. cares what I think. They may care what you think about that. I'm going to give you an answer you won't like. Okay. <laughs> I think you ought to stay focused on Frankfurt. Okay. Uh, I, I, you know, when we're, when we're having regular order in, in Washington and everybody can come to Washington and, you know, and I meet with anywhere from five to 10 groups of constituents every day when I'm there because everybody has their Washington fly in for their national group and they come to see me. And, and the question they always ask is, what can I do? What can we do to be more effective up here? I said, don't worry about up here. I said, first of all, 
whatever your cause is, there are 500 lobbyists or activists or uh, who are already pleading your case. Uh, so your, your point of view is not being ignored. Now, there are always situations in which a particular policy impacts a particular state or, or community in a, in a different way. And we absolutely have to have that information. You know, for instance, I, as the representative of uh, uh, the, the global hub of UPS, if we have transport issues and policy and the jobs of thousands of my constituents are affected, then obviously uh, that's really important. But on the big questions, again, every point of view is already being uh, represented. Mm -hmm. but, and I, but I don't say it only in that respect. If you think about the last 30 or 40 years in this country, with the exception of healthcare, every significant societal change started, at, for good and bad, started at the state and local level. Gay marriage didn't change because of anything Congress did. It was because of a couple of Kentuckians who went to court and John Habern made a decision at the district court level and it went to the Supreme Court. Uh, and on the federal level, minimum wage is still $7.25. But Louisville and cities across the country and states have changed their minimum wages so that now the effective minimum wage is at least 12 or $13 nationally pretty much. Uh, but you go through marijuana laws. Marijuana is still a Schedule One narcotic at the federal level. Meanwhile, about 40% for 40% of the population, it's legal to buy and smoke it. So you can, you can go down the list, you know, all the gun laws, <laughs> all the open carries, I said for good and bad. And so uh, that's all happening at the state level. We can't pass a simple uh, universal background check law. We pass one in the House, we can't pass, get it through the Senate. Uh, so on all of these things, the action is at the state and local level. And that's why I say stay focused because you, you have such a disproportionate impact at the state and local level. That's where most of the action should be. You know, education, my first term, we, we, worked, for, um, we worked for two years. We were in the majority and we had a Senate majority we worked for two years to reform No Child Left Behind. I was on the education committee. We worked like crazy. And, you know, we, we never got it done. It was six or seven years later when it actually was finally reauthorized. And maybe even longer than that. But, you know, the federal government only pays for 10% of education funding, roughly, anyway, in the country. And so most of that action, as we saw with the teachers, uh, ac activities last year, they were pretty damn effective in, uh, yeah. in making their voices heard. And, and so I, I think, again, I think that's where all the, the action is. So uh, again, if there's something about uh, that's, that's per peculiar to your state or your um, region or your community, we definitely need to be heard, to hear you on that. But otherwise, Use your power where it can be most effective. Yeah, that's a that's a very insightful and unexpected answer. So I <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, uh, to uh, to the folks in Louisville, it may not have surprised you, but folks who are from other congressional districts, uh, I just want to affirm that I did not randomly choose that Mandela quote. Uh, some of you may not have had the chance to hear Congressman Yarmouth uh, as much as you did today but maybe you understand why I talked about him as a peacemaker of integrity, of honesty and of humility. Uh, Congressman, I can't thank you enough uh, knowing the schedule you have that you took time to do that today. Uh, you are a real voice for kids and families. And uh, I for one really appreciate that. Uh, Patricia, I think I'm supposed to say, here's Patricia and then you and the Congressman can wrap it up. All right, All right, Terry. Um, Chairman Yarmouth, I just want to echo Terry's uh, great appreciation to you for joining us here today. Um, I was fortunate to be at that Keystone Learning Academy visit um, the other summer, and so it's really um, wonderful to hear what an experience that was for you and how that really resonated. Um, and I want to affirm you in that vision 
for our kids, um, not just because it's good for them um, to get a quality or start, um, but because it's our future. Um, and I think we all uh, really appreciate that focus of yours um, and we'll, are here to support you. Um, I wanted to lift up, uh, you, you painted a picture of really daunting times. Um, we know it's daunting times for kids, it's daunting for you as a leader, um, and we thank you for um, taking charge and, and putting your fight in. Um, and uh, I think affirming to, you know, uh, KYA and the folks here, this is a nonpartisan forum um, because we firmly believe that kids are the common ground and um, everyone cares about kids. Um, and that is where we should be focusing our efforts to work together. Um, and so I also really appreciated you um, calling us out to use our power here locally and at the state level. Um, and we will continue to do that. Um, so thanks again for, for joining us. And um, I'm gonna end with a, a, a few uh, just reminders for everyone. Uh, we have a COVID action hub on our website where you can um, learn more about the federal policies, um, action alerts, ways that you can contact your federal representatives um, and a look ahead to next week. Uh, this pandemic has brought with it a lot of trauma for kids and families. Um, especially for those who had already experienced or were at risk of experiencing other types of trauma. So next week, we're gonna hear from partners about the impact of this trauma and what schools and community organizations can do to create supportive environments that can help kids and their families be more resilient during these uncertain times. So um, you're gonna get a follow-up from Jesse uh, with the RSVP link for next week's forum, along with a recording of this forum and links to that action hub, which I mentioned and other resources in a follow-up email. Um, so with that. Can I say one thing quickly before the end? Sure. Absolutely. Two things real quickly. On the question of, of, of kids and school, I was just thinking about it this morning. You know, we ought to be asking the kids how they, how they want to learn these, uh, in these times. I think it's an opportunity for kids to show some creativity and some, uh, again, engagement in their own education and there's an opportunity to, to, to uh, teach creativity, to teach flexibility, resilience, all of those, those things. And I, I think, uh, I don't know if there's a, there's, there's a way to organize that, but I'd, I'd like to see that happen. Uh, and the final thing that I, I have to say is, please understand that what you see uh, in terms of the way Congress behaves is not the way it really is. It's not a hospital. <laughs> It's not a hostile work environment. We actually mostly all get along really well. I have, I have, dear, friend, I have dear friends on the Republican side who I've never, we've never voted the same way, uh, but we respect each other and, and uh, we're engaged in political theater. We all know that. Uh, that's the, the way the world works. And uh, we, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of, as, as many other are of relishing some food fights, but uh, <laughs> But really, on a day-to-day -day basis, we we do get along, and we we try to. Uh, we have a lot of conversations that are very in private that are very different than we have in public. And what we've got to do, figure out how to do is to have those same conversations in public, and and not just in private. And because then the world won't have, feel like the rest of the world won't feel like they have to pick sides and treat it like a UK and U of L thing. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. Thank you, Congressman, and thanks Thank you to all. everybody joining. See you. See you next week. For all you do. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See you next.